I am um, a professor at Cornell, and I know nobody wants to sit here and listen to a professor talk about their work. So that's not what I'm going to do. But I just want to say that um, we are really grateful to have this relationship with the Akogis because, as most things in life, it was very <coughs> serendipitous. One day, a communication by email, a relationship, because Gen in my program is a Japanese farmer who works for me and, and has helped me manage my rice in the greenhouses at Cornell. Plus the fact that when people, I travel quite a bit and I tell people that I work on rice and I live in Ithaca and I work for Cornell University and they go, what? <laughs> Why do you work at Cornell if you work on rice? I mean, there's no real reason to do that. You can't grow rice very well in that area. And we have no appreciable production of rice in New York State. So one of the things that uh, I've always been the laughing stock of my department because <laughs> I don't grow a crop that's important in New York State. Well, guess what? When, when Ogi showed up at my door and said, we're growing rice in Vermont, you can imagine the light went on. I thought, <laughs> aha, <laughs> now we have it. So actually, um, I'm not going to talk to you about my research. I'm actually here to just say we have been a really, we've been really fortunate to have stumbled into this network that is forming. And my small contribution is really my interest, of course, the fact that I'm a New Englander um, by birth and by upbringing, and then the, the relationship that I have with NSF that has enabled me to suggest to NSF that this was worth supporting and to provide enough evidence to them that it was growing, that it was a new crop. And you know what they care about? They, they're not the U.S. Department of Agriculture. They don't care about your yields per acre or per hectare. They care about the fact that there is a group of people that we could ascribe as innovators. So you are, by NSF standards, innovators. And that's what the National Science Foundation in the United States is always looking to support. So you've joined the group of people that would be considered rice researchers, you're researching how to grow rice as a new crop. You're trying all kinds of new things. You're inventing machinery. You're interacting with people from around the world like any good scientist would do. And therefore, I think that you really have accomplished something as a group. And I'm proud to be part of this group because I think it is truly a driver and an innovator. And I'm very excited because I think it's a very open-minded group trying their best to do something that is really new and yet using existing knowledge. So we've got young and old, we've got north and south, we've got Asia and we've got America, we've got all kinds of mix of people here just hoping to learn something. So I'm going to walk through a few slides if I could to tell you about, for instance, the website in case you haven't stumbled on it. The website that we support is the Rice Northeast US. So Rice Northeast Us, I know that's kind of a long jumbled up uh, set of words, <coughs> .org. This is the website. It has a, um, a revolving set of pictures. I like that one because it shows that we really are in a temperate zone growing rice because the foliage shows. I should get one in the fall. Um, every year on the website we host the um, post, we post what's going on this year and we host all of the um, web presentations from years before. So last year Glenn spoke, um, we had the Farmers Exchange, Anna McClung from, um, from Stuttgart, Arkansas was here, uh, a number of people from Cornell, etc., and the chef's presentation. So if you go on that website and you click um, on this, underneath that says more information. You come to this and you click on any one of them. You can hear Glenn's whole presentation live video stream thanks to the fact that Chris does this every year. Now, there a long, it's a long thing to go through if maybe, what you rem maybe you listen to it once and then you remember something and you're looking for just that segment. And so what Mia does is she actually listens and we extract and she's given you proceedings which is the written verbatim of what people said so you can find those pieces that you want. So you have the hard copy, this is the video stream and sometimes when people are just wanting to like learn a little something it's really interesting to go in and listen to what they have to say and because of the way Chris does this the slideshows come up very nice quality slide presentations. 
The other way you can get to that website is through the website that I run for my project. And as Mia mentioned, this is a small segment of it under education and outreach. So if you click on education and outreach and you scroll down, because we do a lot of different things with Erie, we run courses at Erie, we run different things, uh, you'll scroll down, you'll see ecological farming in the Northeast, and that's going to hit over into that same website I just showed you. This one is a little bit easier to remember, and I'm sorry it's been cut off. It's just www.ricediversity.org, one word, ricediversity.org. You can get to that website if you just remember my last name and you go into McCooch, Rice, you can find it also. Okay, so if those of you uh, who are interested in some of the outreach and education, and specifically that would be here, but if you're interested in the germplasm that we're looking at genetically in the lab, of which a part of it grows in the Northeast, and a, gra a vast portion of it would never grow in the Northeast, but it might come from Nepal, it might come from India, it might come from Korea, you can learn about the germplasm we're working with, which is a much broader swath, and the kind of uh, <coughs> genome evaluations that we're doing both phenotypically and genotypically. Now briefly, ERI, everybody talks about it. I'm going to show you two images so you have some idea of where the group of us that associate with ERI came from. And I just want to make one small correction. Walt. <laughs> yeah, everyone knew. It's not only the men who were the scientists at Erie. <laughs> Way to go. So there's been a generational shift. So I did my time there too, you know. They committed me five years. So this is the International Rice Research Institute at the entrance gate. This behind, and I'll show you in a moment, this is the gene bank. The gene bank where we house most of the world's collection of seeds that eventually get shared with the USDA and get shared with you. It's an earthquake-proof vault here in the basement of this building, and it has its own generator, and it's, it keeps seeds at about negative 20 degrees centigrade with long-term storage capacity and backup. Uh, it has backup in the USDA. It has backup up at the Svalbard Bank in the Arctic Circle up in Norway. These are the world's most precious agricultural commodities when it comes to rice production. This is sort of the source. So Erie is the center for the gene bank as well as for a lot of research. Just to give you a picture of what the place that we've all, we all have, have, have spent many years. These are the rice paddies uh, in the front of Erie, the long-term rice trials that have been going on for 50 years, rice after rice after rice after rice, to demonstrate that there is no requirement to uh, rotate crops if, in fact, you manage your rice correctly, that this is the, old, the world's oldest monoculture, and it manages very well in the soil if you manage the soil properly. You see the volcanic mountains around it. This is sort of the front view. The Erie Farm is many hectares behind that. And this, just so you see, it actually has a campus with buildings where the research is carried out. There's agronomic research, there's genetic research, there's social science research, uh, economics, et cetera. And these, the people in this audience, each of them, have contributed to this very large endeavor uh, over the years. So this is physically what the place looks like. I just thought I'd give you a few ideas of that. And then uh, for those of you who are, of course, temperate, it, we have the rice patties here, which we've been very um, pleased actually to see developing over the years and it's sort of living proof that a bit of um, careful attention to detail in terms of both the environment and the genetics of the plants you're working with can give you a pretty good return on your investment. Um, I want to introduce a few of the pioneers who've been here. Of course, you've, you've heard from Christian. Um, Eric, I think, is not here today. Uh, Eric Andrews is another uh, producer who's producing here in the, in the Champlain Valley. Uh, Ogie, of course, is the, the grandfather of the, of the occasion. We have a lot of people who come to share ideas through the, the exchanges that take place, both on the technology side and on the just production side. And I've been very, very, very stimulated, actually, by the way in which this proceeds. And this is the after lunch session, so you'll hear more today. And I just want to say that we also have quite a bit of work going on at Cornell. I'm just going to show you the one bite that has to do with this group. And that is that we're making crosses between the Yukihkari, which is the adapted line here, to some 
aromatic and purple rices to bring in aroma and purple pericarp into the rices that are adapted for your uh, growing pleasure here. So these are the crosses that Gen made, Gen and Sandy made. Sandy spoke last year. You see the purple pericarp uh, peeking out. These are the F1s after you make the cross um, because you've had to emasculate. So this is showing you the purple pericarp on the F1s. Uh, this is a white pericarp, but it's an aromatic. And we're bringing in uh, aroma and the purple pericarp into what we hope will be eventually a release for you. So that's going on at Cornell, and we're doing that through a back cross selection program using markers, using molecular markers to assist us to move very quickly. We hope to be able to do this in another two and a half or three years. And then I just want to say every, every year we do have a photo. So if everybody is going to at least be here until lunch, let's have the photo before lunch. That way we'll make sure we have the full range of people who've attended this year. This was uh, last year's photo. And I just wanted to say we also have, um, this year we're going to have a raffle. So, um, <laughs> you too. We have two shirts to raffle. This has a very small Erie logo on the back, but it's really kind of a nice generic rice t-shirt. These are both size larges, very nice, all cotton, okay? And um, this is not about money, but you know, I just thought we would allow some people to have these snazzy t-shirts. So these are our options. So after the photo, maybe um, we'll during lunch, we'll collect uh, what you want to do for raffles, and we'll, we'll let that be the afternoon. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much.